Okay, so in this module, we are going to start talking about imagery. And imagery is not really in the book. The motor cognition stuff is in chapter 11. So you'll if you just sort of pick out the pieces about motor cognition, you'll be all right. Which is a little odd because one of the main authors of research field is imagery. So I don't know why it's not in the book, but it's not. So we're going to cover a little bit of stuff outside the book on this chapter. <clears throat> so really what we're moving into from talking about perception and attention is uh, memory. So how do we represent knowledge? So we're, we're clearly taking in the knowledge, that's the perception, and we're clearly focusing on the knowledge, that's attention, but how do we um, represent that um, in our minds? So a little bit of recognition in there as well. So a couple types of systems. We're gonna talk about perception-based systems first. So um, that's all your visual and all your verbal stuff. Um, and really that's more about um, the way that it is perceived, so uh, it comes in through the, uh, the like an Im image kind, so this visual or words would be verbal, and that is most of our perceptual experience, and so that's the way it's stored, so it matches how it came into the system. <clears throat> so why should we care about any of this? Because imagery is... Um, sort of like, okay, I can study memory and I can study attention, who cares about imagery? Well, really it's studying more how our mind takes all the information we're getting from attention and organizes it to create this perceptual picture. So imagery is kind of important and it's also really neat as you'll see. Uh, especially this new field called embodied cognition. So embodied cognition is this idea that when you are imagining doing something, so imagine tying your shoes, and don't say loop, swoop, and pull, because three-year-olds do not understand that. But if you ask someone how they tie their shoes, they have a really hard time explaining to you because it's a um, procedural action now. Most of us have got that down. Um, when you ask someone to imagine doing that, the brain area that's involved in... Um, doing that, like the muscle movements, so remember muscles up here, uh, the frontal cortex, um, are activated as if you're actually doing it. So you're just imagining tying your shoes and your brain is acting as if you really are tying your shoes. It's a pity that doesn't work for working out, right? Um, I could just imagine working out, maybe I would lose weight. Mm, probably not. Um, so if you are singing to yourself or you have a song stuck in your head, it uh, would be Broca's area because that's speech production. <clears throat> so motor cognition is um, mental processing specifically tied to the motor system that draws on stored information, so uh, procedures, to plan actions. So when you are going to reach for something, my water glass here, <clears throat> it's the mental processing that's involved in planning that action. It's uh, part of embodied cognition, but it's very specific to the motor, uh, the motor system. Embodied cognition could be a lot of different things, and this is more specific to actions. But actions are the easiest thing to study, so most people study actions. <clears throat> uh, and one thing you have to make sure that happens is that uh, people can have this shared motor representation. So it's our ability to imagine others doing actions. So I can represent actions that someone else might do, so I can imagine somebody else riding a bike, but also I can imagine um, <clears throat> myself riding a bike if I saw somebody doing it. So it's our ability to um, to represent motor movements based on others. Okay, and then motor imagery just all by itself is uh, imagining an intended action. So motor cognition is the big field, and within that you have to uh, see if people have that shared motor representation. So some people get at mimicry and some are not. Uh, and that uh, imagining event is motor imagery. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about experiments in perceptual-based systems, so verbal and visual, and then experiments in motor-based systems so we can look at both types of imagery, so both perceptual and motor. Okay, so starting with perceptual. Um, the big field in this area is dual code theory. This is Pavio's research and this will come back when we talk about uh, reading and categories. So it's a big theory. And the idea is that we have representations for both visual and verbal information. Now remember they're processed in different parts of the brain so it shouldn't be too surprising that they're sort of separate things. 
And we are much better at remembering information if it's encoded in two different ways. So if I give you a picture and tell you the story, visual verbal, I'm much better at remembering that information because I've got two representations for it over just having one. So two is better than one. So you can remember dual code as two is better than one. If I've got both perceptual, uh, perceptual systems going, I'm going to do better. <clears throat> So what they did to test this was they showed people spatial arrangements of words and their corresponding pictures, so objects. And we remembered the most when we got a surprise memory test at the end when they're the same. So let me give you an example. If I give you a layout here of a circle, triangle, and a rectangle in this particular order, uh, and then I also gave you that same sort of picture but in words, uh, you're much better at remembering this layout, like you can recreate it, if those two match. So that's dual code, because I got one code for visual, one code for verbal. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the perceptual systems. <clears throat> Another perceptual study is this uh, mental rotation task. So this is Shepard and Metzler's studies that are pretty famous from the 70s on can people rotate objects this was like this sounds silly, but this is a very important question when you're thinking about um, pilots or um, engineers. So anyone who has to sort of imagine the way things look um, because they're not it's not right in front of them. Okay. So if you ask people which of these is the same, so can you you say actually um, can I rotate object one to match object two? Lots of people say yes, but this is actually a mirror image. So you actually cannot rotate them to be the same at all. Okay. And so, um, well, here we go. Uh, Shepard and Metzler's study was much more complicated. And so they gave uh, people these 3D objects um, and asked them if they were the same or not. Uh, and this picture is really terrible because of PowerPoint made it a funny color. But uh, they, can we rotate this one on the left to match the one on the right? So the question people were asked were, are they the same object? And so what we used is both reaction times and the degree of rotation to determine what's going on in the brain. Let me give you a picture. Um, a and B are basically the same picture. Um, and so uh, the one on the left is the picture plane, and the one on the right is depth, but they tell the same story. So what's happening? Um, as we rotate it, so it looks, it takes people a whole second to determine if the pictures are the same, if it's actually the same picture. <laughs> so if it's at zero degrees, which means they're the same picture next to each other, it takes them almost a second to say, yes, that's the same picture. So 3D objects are kind of hard to start. Remember, a second is a long time in the brain. Okay. Um, and then, or yes or no, it could be no. As we slowly rotate, so this is 180 degrees out here. Um, as we slowly rotate one of them, uh, it gets harder and harder. So it takes us almost up to five seconds, which is just forever, to determine if um, those two objects are the same or different. So what does that mean people are doing? Think about it this way. If it's 180 degrees, what they're doing is boop, 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 right? They are taking the time to actually rotate it. If it was a simple comparison task, so let me look at this end over here and this end over here, okay, they're the same. What you would see is actually, it didn't matter how far they were rotating. Um, and so it would be just a flat line straight across because the rotation wouldn't matter. It would be about how complex the picture was. Instead, what you see is this almost perfect line for how far away it's rotated and how long it takes. So people are clearly rotating the object in their mind to help make this mental picture. Um, and so picture plane and depth are just two different ways they've tested it. Unfortunately for us ladies, men are faster at this task, but not by a whole lot. <clears throat> so, some more recent re uh, research on mental rotation. <clears throat> we rotate familiar figures faster. Shouldn't be a shock. If it's familiar, it's easier to rotate. Clear pictures faster than blurry ones. Also not a shock. This does slow as we age. That's why there are um, age limits for um, things like... Um, Fly, air flight controllers and um, uh, pilots, that sort of thing, because we do slow down. 
And the neatest thing is people who are born deaf and are fluent in ASL, so American Sign Language, so that is a very visual language, and you got to think about the fact that you're not always looking at people uh, head on. You might be looking at them from the side, so you might have to rotate what hand signal that they are making because you're not looking at them face on. Okay, uh, they are extremely good at this task. So having that much extra visual practice makes you better. So we can learn to be quick at this um, if we have lots of practice. <clears throat> okay, so mental rotation, perceptual task. Uh, let's move on to motor cognition. And most of the work I'm going to talk about is by Sion Bylock. Um, her, uh, she's at the University of Chicago. Her stuff is super neat. Um, she's written a book called Choke. She does a lot of research on, um, math ability, but also a lot of research on athletes and what causes them to choke, um, hence the title of the book. And, um, how, how motor cognition is represented in the brain. <clears throat> so what she did, she had two groups of people, so uh, hockey players and football players, because she likes hockey, and measured a couple different things. So for one independent variable, they had the type of question. This will make more sense in a minute. It either matched or didn't match. Um, and then uh, the question either matched their sport or not. So neutral sentence didn't match anybody's sport, hockey sentence or football sentence. And then she measured their reaction time. So here's what it looked like. Um, these are neutral pictures, so what happens is you get the sentence, the saw, a child saw the balloon in the air. You would either get picture A, where you would say, yeah, that picture matches the sentence, or picture B, where you say, no, that picture doesn't match because that balloon is deflated. Okay, so this is the match-no-match -match part. It either matches the imagery in the sentence or it doesn't. And then this is neutral, so it doesn't have any hockey relations. Okay. So you might have the woman put the umbrella in the closet down here at the bottom, so that matches B over here, versus uh, the mismatch would be put the umbrella in the closet and it being open. You wouldn't do that. Okay. The next thing that she had were specific hockey questions. I'm not very good at hockey, but I can do this part. Um, the referee saw the hockey helmet on the player. Okay, That's going to have the face mask down. Um, because that is how you play, otherwise you get poked in the eye. Uh, and then the referee saw the hockey helmet on the bench. It's going to be open because you've got to be able to put it on. Right? So the fans saw the hockey net after the player slid into it, so you're going to see it from behind. Um, and it's fallen over. And then the, um, the fans saw the hockey net after the puck slid into it. It's going to be standing up. Okay? So these are hockey-specific questions. The, on another experiment, she had um, uh, football questions. So the coach saw the football player on the bench. They're sitting in the huddle. They're standing uh, during team prayer, uh, during a coin toss. Wait, there's even more of them. Um, offensive linemen's protecting the quarterback, protecting the ball, right? <clears throat> uh, defensive uh, defenseman's if stopping an offensive lineman or blocking a kick, so your arms are up. Um, so all of these are very specific actions, this is why it's motor cognition, that either matched the sport, did not match your sport, or were neutral, and either matched the sentence or not. Okay, so this is a two by three design, because we've got two, can, two groups in one, three groups in another. What happened? Well, what she found is that just overall sentences that match are faster for everybody. So if I have, I saw the balloon in the air and I get the picture of the balloon like it's floating, I'm much faster. Okay, and that makes sense because it matches the picture, the image that we're creating when we read the sentence. But even better, the sentences that matched your expertise, so if you were a hockey player, you did much better at the hockey sentences, match or no match. You're faster than people um, overall. And um, so the football players are good at the football questions, even when they mismatch. Uh, the hockey players are better at the hockey questions. And those poor schmucks who don't play either were sort of only okay when they matched. <clears throat> okay, so um, the expertise issue, uh, so the motor cognition, those folks, since they play those sports, were faster at this task because they can imagine what that looked like faster than the rest of us who had to think about how we've seen somebody else doing it. Uh, so it's embodied cognition. I'm imagining doing it. It activates the parts of my brain as if I was actually doing it, which makes me faster at this sentence 
task. <clears throat> okay, so what does that mean? Um, so we are faster because there are more brain parts working on it. And this is a little weird, but more brain parts mean we don't have to think quite as hard. So as our brain is uh, churning through all this information, um, we are faster because of our expertise, and we don't have to think quite as hard. <clears throat> Another study, two more. One on baseball players, which won't be what you think, and one on um, expert typists, and then I'm going to might tell you a little bit about a study that we do in our lab that's very similar to hers. Okay. All right, so in this baseball study, what they did was they had uh, college baseball players, so they had expertise at baseball, and they asked them to judge how well they were hitting the ball. <clears throat> so, in theory, expert baseball players should be better at predicting their performance because they have the expertise, the more of the brain parts for hitting. So they're imagining or using their motor imagery that they're gonna hit the ball well. So what happens is they hook them up in these virtual reality machines and they're fake hitting balls. So they actually um, are uh, swinging um, a, like kind of like a Wiimote and they're saying, telling them how, how well are you hitting this ball. <clears throat> but <laughs> if, and what happens is that because they're imagining doing it well, they're terrible at predicting how well they're actually doing. So if you have them imagining uh, that they're hitting these balls and they say, oh, I'm doing great, they are actually not doing great and um, are very terrible at figuring that out. So motor imagery doesn't help us all the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it helps us uh, verify sentence faster, but it does not actually help predict your own performance. And so you got to think about this. So they're thinking, I'm going to do well, I'm going to hit this ball well, but we're not giving them any of the haptic feedback, so the touch feedback that you get from actually hitting it, so they can't judge um, because the imagery is good, but there's no um, physical feedback to say, okay, maybe I'm not doing so well. So kind of a funny result because it's not what you would expect, but it does make sense given um, uh, the uh, perceptual feedback that you would normally get. <clears throat> All right, in this typing study. So what they did in the typing study was they gave people letter dyads, that means there's two of them, um, and they asked them to pick either FV or DL. So people would pick. Uh, let's go with DL. And KI or SP? Let's go KI. VT, NR. Uh, NR. Uh, DW, AP. I'm going to go AP. Okay. So you were just picking back and forth, back and forth. So what's going on in this study? So we took uh, skilled typers, so people who typed fast, and novice typers, people who typed slow, <clears throat> and gave them these letter dyads. So those letter dyads are either on the same finger, so F and V are on the same finger, and D and L are on different fingers when you're typing. K and I are on the same finger, S and P are different fingers. Um, so all of the ones on the right are different fingers, all of the ones on the... Um, on the left are the same finger, except DW, but that's on the same hand anyway. Okay. <clears throat> so what we're doing is we're seeing if skilled and novice typers will differ in their preferences for either the same fingers or different fingers. You should prefer different fingers because those are easier to type on the motor system in your brain, remember? Ah, we like things that are easy. Okay, we don't want to think that hard. So we were just seeing, picking, seeing how their preference went. So what do we find? Um, we find that um, experts should prefer key press combinations that are different because things that are easier to type are on different hands, sorry, um, and they don't notice that they're on different hands. So if you ask people, what was this study about? Did you notice anything? They have no clue. Um, I only think one person in all these different studies that she's done has said, oh yeah, I noticed that these were on different hands. Um, so they threw them out of the study. But... Uh, uh, it has to be motor cognition because it can't be um, focused picking, right? Because they don't know what's going on. <clears throat> so finally, now, what did they find? <clears throat> Novices show no difference in preference. It's 50-50. It's chance. Left, right, I don't know. These letters look good. Those letters look good. I don't know. Experts definitely prefer different finger combinations. So what you see is, at, for novices, it's at chance. Same hand, different hand, don't care. Experts, it is much greater than chance. They prefer the different hand combinations much more than the same hand combinations, like you would expect. 
What we have done in our lab is look at how people prefer words based on how easy they are to type. So words that um, change fingers more often should be easier to type. So people come into our lab and they write how pleasant they think words are. They think it's a really strange task because we give them fake words too, like geef. They think it's really weird. Um, and so people will rate words as more pleasant if they switch fingers more often. So we've gotten the same sort of results. Um, and people who are expert typers, so people who type faster, um, uh, show this even more. Okay, so it is based still on expertise. <clears throat> Okay, last section, a little bit different. So we've talked about perceptual systems, visual and verbal, and motor systems. And then uh, what we're gonna do now is talk about cognitive maps. So cognitive maps are a, um, a system that uses all of the above, and it's a mental representation of things in your environment. And this is really gonna help us understand a lot of the knowledge-based stuff that's in one of the next modules. Um, so it's sort of a picture of the environment, so that's a perceptual system, but also a motor system because you're moving around in your environment, so it's both. And so it's the way we represent geographic space. How do we understand spatial information? So I asked you, how do you get to your car from here? Or if you are at home, how do you get to your job, to your favorite restaurant, whatever? <clears throat> you would give me directions. And so it's sort of understanding how people get that idea of directions. <clears throat> so there's two types of two types. So the first section is about um, more like what the map looks like. So there are route maps where um, you are going from A to B. And so this is like when you first move somewhere. So it's a novice sort of map and it's route specific. So when I first moved to Springfield, it was I've got to go down this road, to this road, to this road to get to school because it's the only way I know and I can't get lost because I get lost easily. Um, so it was very turn here, turn here, turn here. Okay, and this is the kind of directions you give to people who don't know where they're going in town. So turn left here, turn right there, here's the street kind of thing. <clears throat> As you gain expertise in an area, you switch to a survey map. Survey maps are more um, 3D, if, uh, not 3D, uh, third person if you will. So it's a representation, a representation of space as more of a location generalized. So it's route independent um, and more information about the spatial arrangement. So you'll go about three miles and turn by this ping. It's on the north side of town or it's three streets up and two streets over. So it's it's more, um, more in relation to other things. Oh, so it's over there next to this new thing. So these are later in um, expertise, so they take you a little bit longer to learn. <clears throat> if you play any of the big uh, online gaming systems that have big worlds, like uh, uh, WoW, or um, I'm not sure about some of the other ones, but I imagine that Halo and Call of Duty have specific worlds that they have. Um, <clears throat> This would be when you remember, okay, this thing is over here uh, by these other objects versus I have to go three miles north and two miles left, that sort of thing. <clears throat> okay. The other two types of cognitive maps are more about how you interact with the map. So the first two are really about how we understand spatial relationships, and the second two are more about your interactions. So this really does sound like video games. They are egocentric or they're first person shooters, if you will. So first person points of view where it's you are imagining you walking through the um, through the map versus a more allocentric point of view, which is more third person. So it's perspective independent. I don't have to imagine me walk, getting in my car and driving to school. I can imagine the map from above and how to get to school. Um, so one of the easy ways to think about this, if you play video games, it's first person, first person games versus third person games, um, or just the idea of I have to think about me walking versus I can imagine others doing it is more allocentric. Okay. So all of that put together, imagery in a nutshell, is the idea that we have um, perceptual-based systems and motor-based systems. So just some, talked about some experiments for those, and those are all tied together with the way we interact with the environment which is our cognitive mapping system.